Welcome in to the Subconscious Mind Mastery Podcast. Thomas Miller, thank you so much for being right here. We're going to have a very interesting conversation, something that's been brewing for several days. I've been incubating this, talked to a couple of people about it, have some thoughts on it. And we're going to go somewhere that is in the realm of self-examination of our very core spirituality. It's almost like if you could say walking into our individual spiritual bedrooms. It's the privatest of the private spot that we occupy spiritually. And it's with the intention of making sure that that little compartment of our life is the purest, cleanest, and most empowering that it can be. And I have to say right off the bat that this is going to be an episode that my intentions of delivering this are, I've I've done my gut check here. It's like I am in a pure state of wanting to communicate something that I think is important that we all should look at. But my methodologies and my frailty as a human being could be flawed. So this little series, I think we're going to go definitely more than one. It's a matter of whether we only end up with three. (laughs) But uh, my heart is pure in this. It truly is. And I want for you nothing more than your highest timeline. And this is coming through and basically clearing anything that might be hidden or subtle that could be limiting or distracting that very path. So please know where I'm coming from. I'm coming from a desire for you to be on your highest timeline. And there might be a couple of things that we just don't think about every day that could slip into the way of that. And that's what we're going to pick apart. Now, obviously, what you do with this is totally and completely up to you, right? You have ultimate choice. This is going to put some seeds into your garden. You're the gardener. You can choose what to do with them. Another thing about this little series is that it's being recorded under Venus in retrograde 2023, which is, as we've been talking about on the Fun Astrology podcast, just a perfect, perfect time to do this self-exploration work because Venus represents, in a sense, everything that is very core important to us. And there's nothing more important to us than our spirituality, our spiritual path. We live in the physical world, but we thrive in the spiritual world. Highest timeline stuff, this is. One other quick thing, and then I'm going to jump in. This is being recorded at home, at my home studio. But right after I finish this, I'm going to load up Lord Jupiter and hit the road for a few days. And the rest of this series will be done from the road. So you'll hear the change in the audio for sure. But this is going to give a good perspective, and I'm really looking forward to this. Not only kind of bringing you along with the trip on the trip, but also the fresh new scenery will bring some fresh new perspectives. And that's going to be a good thing. So this is a a really cool little thing that we've got going here. Hope you enjoy it. All right, let's start this off with the story that began the thought process. They recently had International Day in the area where I live. It's a fun Saturday of events around celebrating different cultures around the world. It's a really cool thing, and it's been here in these mountains 40 years they've been doing this. Well, the afternoon, I'm going to say probably marquee event, was a group or a troupe of dancers from Mexico. Man, were they something else. Probably about 20 or 25 people, and the guy, the only percussion was this guy standing in front of this drum. It probably was about 14 inches around and maybe four feet tall, and he was pounding it with two drumsticks, and it was powerful rhythm energy. Oh, my goodness. And then with all these people out dancing in their full regalia, I thought, wow, if you had stumbled onto this energy in a Mayan jungle somewhere, I could see how this would overcome and overwhelm you. I mean, this was very powerful energy. It also speaks well to group energy, like when a group of people come together in order to celebrate some common intention, as this was a tribal dance. Very, very strong. So here was this dance troupe that had traveled from Mexico, full, colorful. Oh, I can't even describe how beautiful their costumes and uniforms were. Then they had these headdresses that were feathers that just extended out probably three or four feet, literally, from each person. Talk about extending an aura. But they brought out, at the beginning, some one person brought out this 
carved image of, I'm presuming, some kind of God in their culture. And he walked it around to the front and thought, okay, so this is obviously some dance or celebration or honor of this deity. And then I noticed that all of the dancers in this beautiful headwear that they had, right in the middle was, right on their forehead, right above their forehead, was a skull. Now, there was too much going on for me to personally try to tune into the energy of this. I felt no negative energy whatsoever. In fact, I felt the celebration of what they were doing, and I felt the power of that, just that percussion and the dancing and the movement was a really strong energy. That was what I felt. But it was not without my own personal bias for a few seconds. As I saw those skulls and I saw that idol and I went back to my roots and I thought, ooh, what is this spiritually? And then the thought just hit me that our own spirituality can either be a place of tremendously high worship and protection, which is actually one of the symbolisms of the things that they brought out. And doing some digging, I find that that is part of the Mayan culture was these things for protection and honor of God, source, the highest of all that they saw it as, or it can very easily tip into something where malefic, malicious entities come to feast and realized that our own spiritual practices can be a feeding ground for malicious malcontents. I'm talking about the ones from the non-physical side. <laughs> there are plenty on the human side. We're not talking about that. We're talking about malicious entities that can come into our spiritual practice. And then I started to walk this back. And you realize how so many ancient stories, and pick whichever one you want to associate with, from the Bible, from the Quran, from history itself, that some kind of spiritual practice, let's just put it that way, turned sour. I mean, look at the Inquisition, the 1100s and 1200s. In the name of the Lord, if you don't like what we say, off with your head. Praise be to God, we removed the infidel. Look at Islam and look at the series of wars in medieval Islamic times. The Arab-Byzantine wars, 400 years of killing each other over a belief system. Look at the Crusades. All praise to Allah. We removed some Christians from the planet today. Look at Judaism. Moses goes up the mountain to get the very commandments from God, and the people start, well, having group sex, basically, and worshiping idols, worshiping other gods. Now, here's what I thought to set the stage for this. Let's listen to some excerpts from Fred's book called Clearing Entities. This, of course, is from the audiobook, Chapter 1. I'm just going to pull a couple of excerpts here to set the stage about malefic creatures that are in and among us that feed off of human energy. This is a perfect way of setting the stage. So that's going to be the rest of this episode. I said this was going to go into multiple parts. So this will get us established. And just looking at that, all of a sudden, what dawned on me is that just like other areas of our lives where these portals can open, you're going to hear about it in the book, that the very essence of our spiritual path and walk can be one of those portals. Like the tribal dance, the skull could be a representation or an intention of wisdom, ancestry. To the Buddhist, it was a symbolism of mindlessness, the neutral state. To the Celtics, it represented the source of the soul. It was the center point of the soul, and it also was a seat of power. So this is all about the intention or the interpretation, because to one, it's about the nothingness of our existence. We've been talking about that on Sundays on the Tao Te Ching. Well, here's a representation. Or to some, it's a symbolism of our ancestors, honoring those who gave us this life and knowing that in some way they're still supporting us. To others, it's a guardian, it's a barrier, a barricade to evil spirits. And to some, it is the evil spirit itself. We are going to come all the way back around to that as this little series unfolds. But to set the stage, let's first look at how our own spiritual path could be an energetic feasting ground that we need to examine. 
So this is from a very important audiobook. If you haven't listened to this, it would be a great way. Help support the podcast and get this book. It's a quick listen, and it will give you all the tools that you need in order to unfold what we're going to dissect here in these upcoming episodes. This is from Clearing Entities by Fred Dodson. You are a lovingly created divine being. Anything involuntary you feel or do is therefore not you. Anything happening in your body-mind that is not determined by you was put there by something else. I call this something else entities. If you wake up in the morning feeling depressed instead of refreshed, it's probably not something you consciously chose. Given a choice, what early morning state would you pick? Light and loving? Cozy and cute? Fresh and free? Calm and collected? Warm and well? Cool and clear? How did you fall for the idea that it's not your choice? You make the choice to get up, take a shower, and drive the car. Why wouldn't you make a choice for what to think and feel? As a divinely created being, your word is your wand. If you wake up and say, I feel fresh and free, that word dispels any energy to the contrary, and you feel fresh and free. The only exception to this is if there is something within you contradicting your word. Anything contradicting your word cannot be you, because there is only one of you, and you are the boss. There's you, there's your identity, and there's the entity. Wait a minute. There's a difference between me and my identity? In my view, yes. I've gone into this in my 2006 book, Parallel Universes of Self. You are essence, spirit, soul, or higher self. Your identities are roles you can play on earth to experience certain viewpoints. And then there are entities. Healers also call them energies. Christians call them demons. Muslims call them jinn. In Christian culture, all demons are undesirable, whereas jinn can be good or evil. In Buddhism, they are called hungry ghosts. Taoists call them gui and provide 17 acupuncture points for clearing them. In Ayurvedic medicine, they are called bhuta. The most general term is spirits. Every culture has names for entities and ways of treating them, except for our modern science paradigm, which has created a veil of ignorance around the topic and replaced the clearing of entities with the magic potions of the pharma industry. Entities benefit from not being known or detected. They celebrate modern society that calls them non-existent. You can't clear or cure a thing that is claimed not to exist. Roughly speaking, there are only two categories of entities, demons and fragments. Both live in the astral realm, which is a band of frequency above, at, and below Earth, corresponding to lower, middle, and higher astral. Every planet, object, figure, body, or thing has an etheric version of itself that exists in this realm. What I call the lower astral realm is more dense than our earthly realm. This is probably a surprising statement to most people because most teachings say that non-physical beings are less dense. It's important to understand that both less and more dense things and beings are invisible to the human eye and usually are outside of our experience. The demonic entities have their own distinct personality, an independent consciousness. They live at lower consciousness levels and have, from a human perspective, ill intent. Their home is our hell, and our earth is their heaven. Most entities that humans deal with are not demonic. They are fragments. These are like astral debris floating around, looking for a physical being to attach to. Both demons and fragments are parasitical for humans, 
scheming to gain energy and physical experiences they no longer have access to in the underworld. From a human perspective, it is best that entities are gotten rid of quickly. Fragments can be released easily and quickly, the same way one might release troublesome emotions. But as easy as they are to release, it can have a profound difference on your health and well-being. Spirituality versus Spiritism I'm not saying that entities are responsible for your ills. It is your own misconduct that attracts them. An entity is a non-physical being that attaches itself to a physical body as a parasite. This disembodied being leeches off life, force, and energy. The body is then host to an entity. Most people subconsciously know they have one or several entities attached to their body, but only a few consciously know it. Sometimes there is a perceived or alleged benefit you get from entities in return for giving them a home. In rare cases, the payoff is consciously known. You already know about these kinds of things at some level. Once you're finished with this audiobook, you might wonder how you could have ever forgotten. Inversion of truth is an entity agenda. Yes, entities have an agenda. One of their agendas is to weaken humans. If they weaken these divine beings, it is easier to attach to them or possess them, by which they can more fully experience physical reality. Here is a whole different perspective on life. You are a divine being. That's why all these creepy floating things want to try to get some of that heavenly vibe. An analogy? Imagine a very attractive and clean woman walking through a seedy part of town, and hundreds of lustful and greedy eyes are peering at her. The crowd of miscreants wouldn't mind getting some of that vibe. The woman feels repulsed. This is what any human being is to an entity. Yummy food. The spirit with a capital S versus a spirit with a small s couldn't be more different. They are so at variance, they shouldn't really be named the same thing. The Spirit, capital S, is the Higher Self, a radiant and divine being unlike any other. And a Spirit, little s, is a broken-off fragment of the disposable astral body or a lower-realm parasite. The Spirit, capital S, is immortal. A Spirit, lower s, is just hanging on to extend its life, but soon to disappear. Spiritism is the gradual enslavement of the spirit. If you're not sure whether someone is involved in spiritism, which is entity-based, or spirituality, which is higher realm-based, simply look at the fruits or the results of their work or teaching. Loveless Sex Faux, quote-unquote, spiritual places are not the only feeding grounds for entities. They can go anywhere for their energy. One of the places they most resonate with are porn cabins, brothels, and sex salons. If you've ever walked near or inside such places and felt an icky and scratchy feeling, it's because of all of the entities floating around. Sex is the most exciting activity for entities because it's the most physical. Entities are made of electricity, and sex is pure electricity. Most entities are split-off parts from people who died. If they died with unfulfilled sexual desire, a fragment will float around looking to fulfill that physical sexual desire and resonate with humans who have a similar sense of unfulfillment. But even entities who have no unfulfilled sexual longing seek sex simply for the energy discharged. And again, that's from Clearing Entities by Fred Dodson. Now, the reason I wanted to include and stop right there on that topic is because he said that sex is the most exciting to the entities because it is the most physical. Well, what about the spiritual equivalent? That's our connection with highest source, right? I mean, isn't that on the spiritual side 
the equivalent of the climax on the physical side? Now go with me here for a second, because this is important. Put on the hat, if you will, for a second, of a really malefic, gnarly, narky being. You're not going to show up like a rattlesnake. You're going to show up like the serpent in the garden that was very attractive. And it's already easy for you to feed off of that physically created energy. Loveless sex, as he said. But what about feeding off of spiritually created energy? And that's what I'm getting at here. And that's why I'm suggesting that it's good for us to all do a willing examination and just explore. If there's no connection, if there are no portals, if there are no holes, if nothing has teleported in and is feeding off of that side of us, then there's no concern. But as I said in the beginning, if this, even mentioning this, brings up some kind of angst, then there's something to take a look at. That will be our next topic. So... To summarize, there are entities that we are not aware of. I think Fred made that strikingly and compellingly clear. And it's important to know this is not to create fear. Entities are not the reason for every little thing in our lives. In fact, if you're living on a high vibration timeline, chances are you're rarely, if ever, exposed to them. If you're around environments where they could come in and feast and feed like he was talking about, not just on sex or sexuality, it's on anger, it's on any of these negative emotions, then it is worth taking a look at. Because, third point, entities do feed off of human energy. And then fourth, my argument is that our spiritual path, based on history as well of major organized religions, is that our spirituality can be a place where entities enter and feed. So, stay with us on this series. It's going to be good, and we'll pick that apart on the next episode. Thanks so much for listening. I'm Thomas Miller. Stay high vibe and enjoy the journey.